Church, before we stand and read the scriptures today, we begin now in Romans chapter 5. And if you're a note taker, and I hope you are, Romans chapter 5 is a very, very deliberate change in the tenor of the entire book of Romans from here on out. Chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 addressed very key things. From here on out, Paul turns his back, as it were, on the world, and he turns his back on legalism, he turns his back on the uh, paganism of the world, and now he dials down on speaking to the church. So frankly, you guys, congratulations. Uh, all of you have now come to this moment where chapter five, he begins to disciple us. Everything previously, how long have we been in the book of Romans? A year? Something like that? Um, now that's all behind us. And now he begins to speak doctrine to us that will be incredibly instructive and comforting. And from here on out, you ought to get excited because from here on out, you're going to be hearing regarding the strength and the joy and the power of your salvation and how secure you are as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ in that salvation. And so with that, the title of this message for the next few weeks will be All is Forgiven. All is Forgiven. And uh, just saying that might generate some questions in your mind. That's okay. Write those questions down. How can that be possible? Why is it important? How does God forgive sin? Why do I even need forgiveness? Write those questions down and see if God doesn't answer them over the course of these next few weeks. I read, um, as many of you have read, John Maxwell's books. He's got his uh, great book, 21 Indispensable Qualities of a Leader, bestseller. Uh, of course, uh, John Maxwell, author and speaker. And in that book, he talks about a story, and I want to read it to you, and uh, so that you can even look at it together with me. A story about a father and a rebellious teenage son. The son had done wrong, caught red-handed and ashamed. He ran away from home. In the account of the father, he searches all over Spain for his son Paco, but he couldn't find him anywhere. And finally, while in Madrid, in a last desperate attempt to find his long-lost boy, the father placed a one ad in the newspaper, and this is what it said. Paco, meet me at the Hotel Montana at noon Tuesday. All is forgiven. Love, Papa. Now watch this. The father went to prayer that his son would see the ad, and maybe, just maybe, he would come to the Hotel Montana. And so on Tuesday at noon, the father arrived at the Montana, but unfortunately, the police had been called out to control a crowd of some 800 people. But as the father looked more closely, he saw young boys, young men, all of them, made up the crowd because each of them were named Paco. <laughs> they all had come to the hotel to meet their father. 800 young men named Paco read the ad in the newspaper and hoped that the message was for them. 800 Pacos came to receive the forgiveness they so desperately wanted. What a tremendous story and a powerful point to this issue and dynamic about forgiveness. There's something about the heart in each and every one of us, and we'll see it in this study, as to why forgiveness and why redemption and why salvation is so important and why God is so good to make sure that you know that you are forgiven, that you know that you have redemption. The God of the Bible is kind and gentle, and he wants to bless your life so that you might know that you have eternal life in salvation. Thank God he's not up there on some dark, thunderous cloud, angry, sharpening an axe. That's the way Satan, I'm sure, would want us to view God. If that were the case, there never would have been the gospel message. So church, let's stand together. Romans chapter 5, I'll begin reading in verse 1. If you read verse 2, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. And don't get excited, though. We might make it, 
We might make it past the first two or three words today. <laughs> Romans 5 verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint, but uh, because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Father, we pray that you'd bless the going forth of your word, we ask. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. Therefore, you can almost hear Dr. J. Vernon McGee say, if you've ever listened to him, whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you're supposed to ask what it's there for. <laughs> and uh, he's right, you know, theologically, that statement, that one word is a very powerful Greek word. It means everything that has been said prior to this moment has been foundational to what you're about to hear. And it's all wrapped up in that word, therefore. And it's important and it's powerful. And as I said, it changes the entire direction of the book for us as believers. The book of, book of Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 and 3 says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. So you want to be a careful listener. Verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It's a great salvation. It's a salvation that offers that redemption. It's a salvation that offers that forgiveness. And down deep inside of you and I, each and every one of us longs for forgiveness. One of the worst things that can happen is for someone to pass in death and you didn't settle the account with them. You carry that for the rest of your life. I'm telling you right now, listen, I, this is it's part of my calling is to watch people be born and die. And the greatest thing regarding people in their death is needing to connect with an uncle, with a child, with a mother, with a brother, with a sister. I see it all the time. You know those things that you've pushed off and you think, I've just buried that. I'll just bury it. I'll bury it. Trust me, my friend. On your deathbed, it will come back to you. And God will want to clear the air, as it were. The book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 3, the great priority of our lives is our salvation. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. Faith, of course, is the vehicle by which we put our trust in Christ and salvation is experience, which was once and for all delivered to the saints. And then also regarding our salvation, you don't often think about this. It's pretty cool. This ought to get all young kids' attention. I think it's fun. Is the fact that there's a curiosity, apparently, and there's great attention in the angelic realm regarding our salvation. Did you know that? The Bible talks about angels being very interested in the going forth of the Bible. It's, it's, it's amazing because there are passages of Scripture where when we proclaim the truth of God, the gospel, it says that angels desire to look into these things. There's a curiosity about this uh, message of salvation in 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible there tells us, uh, verse 12 to them it was uh, revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. Isn't that amazing? It'd be, it'd be kind of neat to see, right? Maybe what's going on in the invisible realm here right now in the atmosphere? By the way, the angelic atmosphere, there's no earth or sky. They move in traffic in and out, both through uh, th this whole dynamic. You and I think that this is it, what's below us, it's, that's it. In the angelic realm, the scriptures teach us that angels can pass through what you and I see as material. And according to this passage, 
of Scripture that they're listening. It's amazing. A good thing that we're going to get out of Romans chapter 5 and beyond is the fact that we're going to get answers regarding our human psyche, the way our minds work. And uh, our minds are hardwired for a relationship. This is no revelation to you. You know that. Either right now you're so delighted, you, your marriage is doing great, your heart is fine, and life is beautiful. I mean, you may be in California and it may be perfect weather, but uh, the price of gas is insane. You don't care because you're loved. And you are loving. We were designed to do both, you know. And any one of us, either being starved in loving or starved in being loved, affects our psyche, the way our brains operate the way our emotions operate. But we've been hardwired to be forgiven. Listen, I know this is going to seem strange to you, but we've also been hardwired to forgive. We resist that often. And we fight it. I'm not going to forgive them. There's a great power in forgiveness. And we've talked about that recently, and we'll talk about it some more in the near future. But when a relationship is fractured, when a relationship is in peril, the level of stress is exerted upon our psyche, our soul. That's where we get the word soul, is suke. The thinking, the mind, the operation of the mind. And there's this immense pressure that's placed upon us. And many people, when they don't find forgiveness or issue forgiveness, they're driven to um, pills or drink or psychologist or uh, therapist. Listen, maybe in some of those cases, a doctor would say that this is necessary. But let me encourage all of us, run to Jesus quicker and faster. I'm not excluding any of those. If you're under medical care and that's, listen, that's, may God heal you and may God bless and give those doctors wisdom. But I'm talking about the first move that you and I ought to do as believers is run straight to the one who has forgiven us at the cross. And he's able, I don't know how he does this, but he's able to impart into your heart the ability to forgive other people that you otherwise would not be able to forgive. And some of you, listen, need to forgive yourself. There's a lot of Christians that they just never grow, they never develop because they love God, they love the Bible, they read it, but when it comes to those passages of Scripture where, like my favorite, is Jeremiah 29, 11, when God says to you, I know the thoughts I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of a future and a hope to bring your life to a full and beautiful conclusion. You believe that for everybody else on the planet, but not yourself. And you need to realize that Christ has forgiven you. And I don't mean to pour salt on a wound, but you need to just knock it off and believe him because your emotions will lie to you constantly. All the time. They will play with us. And if we let our emotions take root, by the way, we will develop a very skewed, goofed up worldview. And that's what's happening in our world right now. Unbelievable. Thoughts that are so messed up That when you hear them, you have pity for the person who has that thought, and you can't believe it, that's what you're hearing. And I'm referring to one of our Supreme Court judges this weekend, Sotomayor, said that there's no difference if you kill a baby in the womb, there's no argument that proves that that baby can feel or even be viable even though that child is moving around in the womb. Listen to her argument. She said, because there are people who die and they're laying either at the death scene or even in the morgue and their body will move and they're not alive. That was her argument this weekend. Did you know that? On that criteria, excuse me, One is alive, moving. The other one is in the morgue, dead. When when somebody in the morgue sits up, you know that happens. Those are muscles and tendons that are contracting and drying up. Because they're dead, they move. Listen, a baby in the womb is very alive. The heart is beating. Life, blood is coursing. 
And there's a big difference. But listen, when somebody says, there's no difference, you, you look at that and you just go, what has happened? There is a worldview adopted thinking, and every single one of us have a worldview way of thinking. Every single one of us. And there are things in life that has shaped your thinking. Just know this. Forgiveness and being forgiven is a great part of it. You wouldn't think so, but it's the source of bitterness. It's the source of anger and temper, resentment. Many marriages today are on a perpetual state of shipwreck until you unpack things and then you find out that he or she has held resentment against that person for the last six years. And they never talked about it and it's seething below the surface. And you know what you gotta do? You gotta get that stuff out and get all the poison and get all the stuff. You gotta get it all out like an infected wound. And only then does it work and forgiveness is granted. Why? Because God has hardwired you and I to experience forgiveness. That's when it, that's going to be one of my arguments with you today. Have you experienced the forgiveness of God? It's so important that you be set free, that I be set free. Ronald Reagan said, without God, there is no virtue because there is no prompting of the conscience. Without God, there is no coarsening or hardening of the society. Without God, democracy will not and cannot long endure. Think about that. And I would say that without God, there can be no forgiveness. You look around at our world. I'm going to read this to you. It's very cute. I posted this the other day on Facebook, and everybody said, Pastor Jack, your spelling is horrific. <laughs> well, I'm, <laughs> this, is the actual, this is the actual statement by John Winthrop, so forgive me, but I was being very accurate. This is 1630, and prior to Noah Webster's dictionary for the America uh, and English language in the colonies, this is how they spelled words. To me, it looks totally normal. <laughs> he said, John Winthrop, the famous city upon a hill statement. Now, the only way to avoid this shipwreck and to provide for our posterity is to follow the counsel of Micah. To do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with our God. For this end, we must be knit together in this work as one man. We must entertain each other in brotherly affection. We must be willing to abridge ourselves of our superfluities for the supply of others' necessities. We must uphold a familiar commerce together in all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality. We must delight in each other, make others' conscience or conditions, excuse me, our own, rejoice together, mourn together, labor, and suffer together. Always having before our eyes our commission and community in the work. Our community as members of the same body. Think about that. Now, think about that as a church, but Winthrop was talking about those few that came to settle. So shall we keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. The Lord will be our God and delight to dwell among us as his own people and will command us or command a blessing upon us in all our ways so that we shall see much more of his wisdom, power, goodness, truth than formerly we have been acquainted with. We shall find that the God of Israel is among us. We then of us shall be able to resist a thousand of our enemies. Then he shall make us a praise and glory in the earth. Or that men shall say uh, of succeeding. Um, I forgot which, what that word meant. Plantations. Plantations. Thank you. Exactly. The Lord make it like that of New England. For we must consider that we shall be as, here it is, a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. So that we, that if we shall deal falsely with our God, think of this, in this work, 
We have undertaken and so caused him to withdraw his present help from us. We shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. 1630. In other words, walk before God humbly. Love one another. Be kind and tenderhearted to each other. And sadly, today, America is not kind and tenderhearted one toward another. Sadly, you cannot be a stranger in some community alongside the road and get help. Why? What's going on? America needs to experience the conviction of God so that America can experience the forgiveness of God. And in that, there could be a revival in our nation. America needs to be forgiven. Instead of defending our positions, America needs to get on our knees and cry out to God and ask him to visit us once again. So church, all is forgiven. Our first pass at this is in verses one and two, and it's this. All is forgiven results of being forgiven. What are the results of being forgiven? And the first thing that we see here is that forgiveness creates a new atmosphere. Oh, you think about this for a moment. When he says in verse one, therefore, having been justified by faith, every single one of us as Christians, the reason why we are followers of Jesus is not because of religion. It's because Christ has interrupted our lives some way, shape, or form, and he has gotten our attention. For some of you, you came to him easily. For some of us, we were stubborn. But by some mode, some means, Christ got a hold of you. And what he revealed to you was this. You need me, he would say, didn't he? He said to us, you need me. You need my saving grace. You need my forgiveness. So when the verse here says, therefore, it means here's the answer to everything I've been talking about, Paul says in the previous four chapters, having been justified by faith. That is that you have decided to put your trust in what Jesus has done at the cross. And I love how this plays out. All of a sudden, are you guys listening? All of a sudden, when you and I come to be together, either as a nation as Winthrop was talking about, a colony or a church. When we come together, if we believe that, if we believe that we've come to Christ by faith, then the hostilities are buried. The animosity evaporates. The division ceases. One of the key elements of you knowing that you are a true follower of Jesus Christ is that you know this, you've been justified by faith. Friends, listen up. I cannot stress this doctrine enough. To be justified means that God declares you just if I'd never sinned. You can remember it that way, justified. This is fundamental to Christianity. You're not, listen, it's so fundamental, you cannot be a Christian unless you understand point number one, and that is I'm justified by God based upon the merits of Jesus Christ. I have come to Christ and asked him to forgive me of my sins because I believe he died on the cross for my sins and he rose again from the dead for my justification. And that's where you begin. That's why Paul starts that way. And it, listen, when you understand that, it changes the entire atmosphere of your life, of, of, your, of your head, and of your home. One of the greatest things, and again, we get, to, we get to see it a lot, and you don't maybe see it enough, but when you see a family come to church and they are a wreck, and then maybe mom gets saved or dad gets saved. I had a man talk to me just a couple of weeks ago, and he said, my wife used to go to church here. She invited me to keep coming, keep coming. I kept blowing her off and blowing her off, and then my wife left me. Then I started to come to church here. Well, I told him, your timing's off. <laughs> but his antics just wore her down, and she ran away. And he's gotten his life right with God, and he said, listen, I'm in a place right now that if she comes back, this is awesome, and I want her to come back. But if she doesn't come back, I know this one thing. My life has been changed. Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I live for him. If she comes back or not, I'm a new man. And I, I, I just had to tell him, give me a hug. Chances are, though, she'll see that changed life. And a home can be changed. Why? Because... When the hearts change, the atmosphere changes. The words change. 
That which is critical begins to evaporate. That which is the fault finding begins to stop. And there needs to, and there, there, there necessarily falls next tenderness and caring. And it doesn't happen overnight. And I'm glad it doesn't happen overnight. It happens ever so consistently but slowly along the way so that you know it's real. Have you been forgiven? Have you understood? Have you seen a change in the atmosphere in the world in which you live in? The Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, and you, that's us, being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, that means we were alienated from God when we were lost in this world. The Bible says he has made us alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You say, Jack, that's written 2,000 years ago. How does that apply to me? Thank God it was written 2,000 years ago, and I get to say that it applies to you. If it was written yesterday, you would tamper with it, mess it up. God said it 2,000 years ago, and he calls anyone who wants to have the atmosphere of their life changed and the way that they think changed to experience the forgiveness of God. And that comes by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, having been justified by faith. And again, I told you that Greek word means, which is beautiful, it means to show, to display, to show off, not in an arrogant way, of course, to be righteous, to be declared righteous, and acknowledge justice. God says you are now just. God says this. Acquitted, freed, vindicated. Now, church, listen up. You and I would never make that assessment of ourselves. Let's be honest. You don't say, hey, honey, honey, back off. Be, I'm justified. <laughs> uh, God looks at me as though I've never sinned. You would never say that. That causes you to practice Micah, what John Winthrop talked about. That reality causes the true follower of Jesus to walk humbly with their God. Because God looks at your ledger, remember, the Bible says that God, before you come to Christ, God has been writing down every sinful thought and deed is written down in heaven. The record is written down. But the Bible says the moment you and I come to Christ, God takes that and applies the work of Christ at the cross to that sheet of paper, to your rap sheet. And it's washed away. The Bible says it's cleared. The scripture says Jesus Christ nailed those things to his cross. That's a transaction between God and the Father and God the Son. Faith causes you to enter into that relationship. And you should experience forgiveness. You should know that. You should be enjoying that. Colossians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Bearing with one another... Now, have you ever looked at these verses, and I'm going to read more of it, and say, oh man, that's so hard. But wait, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Forgive them. Yes. This is a tremendous verse. It sounds like a lot of hard work. I must tell you, everything on there is impossible. It's not hard work. It's impossible. It's impossible. Unless God does the work. And here's how it is. That verse can only happen for real. The only way that you can forgive other people is if you understand that God has forgiven you of great stuff. Amen. When you realize that, when you and I think about what God has forgiven us of, now it's a supernatural work. And I say supernatural work that I can go to that person that I'm at odds with and so to speak, bury the hatchet, right? It's over now including the handle, buried. There's no bringing it up anymore. You don't appreciate it when your own mind brings up the stuff you've done in the past, right? How many times, I don't know, is it just me that I have to, I, I have to have like a gate around my mind constantly. And the, by the way, it's a gate of scripture. That if I relax that gate, then my my mind goes back decades and decades ago to sin in technicolor in an instant. Do I remember a book I read 40 years ago? Nope. 
Do I remember going here or there doing this or that? Nope. But was it something that was horrifically sinful against God? Yep. And in color. That's why we gird up what the Bible says is the loins of our minds. Our minds, as it were, has guts. And we need to shore it up. And when I do that, now all of a sudden, knowing what God has forgiven me of, it's easy for you to come to me because the atmosphere has been changed and you can come to me and say what you need to say. Or I can say to you, or there can be reconciliation. There's no more war. He said, she said. Jesus died on the cross for both of you, for all of us. And there's the beautiful result of forgiveness, and that is there's a new atmosphere. Secondly, there's a favored position that we can enjoy. The results of being forgiven is that there's a forgiveness that puts us in a favored position. Verse 1 continues, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2 through whom also we have access by faith into this grace. And here the Apostle Paul reveals to us this divine GPS, as it were, over our lives in reality, that what is absolutely perfect and in chronological order are the stepping stones to the Christian life. Church, you don't have to look far to find out what God would have us to do. We have peace. Stop right there. We have peace. Now, inside your heart right now, you need to ask yourself, do I have peace? That's the first question. Then you dial down a little bit more specific. Do I have peace with God? So the number two thing that is an indicator of the true believer's relationship with God, it's not only that we have this relationship of faith with him, And that we're justified. But the second thing is that there is this remarkable peace that God gives us. And I want you to look at your Bible carefully. It says we have peace with God. It's not a guess. It's it's not saying you're going to have peace with God. This is a remarkable statement. The, The true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ now has peace with God. See, what does that mean? It means that the the true believer is not fighting God anymore. It's, it's not, listen, it's not having the peace. I understand, listen, I know that you as a believer, you have peace inside and that, that's wonderful, but that's not exactly what we're talking about here. You can never have that until you have peace with God. And this peace with God means that you're no longer at war with him. Now, according to the Bible, the Bible tells us that we are warring against God apart from Christ. Did you know that? The scripture says that an unbelieving world wars against God. Always manipulating, trying to figure out, trying to ditch God on this issue and avoid the other and you're angry with God. Not, no, not this. One of the hallmarks of how you know that you are a true born again believer, that you've been forgiven of your sins is that you have the peace now with God that was not there before. You're no longer fighting him. I guess I could say this. You, you now turn to God and say, Lord, what do you want of me? What do you want me to do? I want to do what you want, God. I want to find out from your Bible what you want me to do next. Peace with God. No more games. No more fighting. I don't mean to upset you, but peace with God means no more religion with God. I know some people love their religion. I, 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 you know, I love the chanting, or I love the candle, or I love the lighting, or I love the moment, or I love the, uh, the liturgical portions or descriptions or displays of it all. I just like this. And I must say, people, it is very possible that America has never been more spiritual, but we are definitely far from God. We've got all kinds of beliefs going on now, and people really latch on to traditions, religious traditions. A tradition's not bad, but if you make that tradition something by which you are obtaining some form of acceptance to God, now that is a religion that has fallen from grace. That's, that's, that's a religion that keeps you from having a relationship. 
You ought to be able to know your God and the goodness of your God, no matter where you are in the world. At any time, no matter what. If in prison or in a palace. God wants you to know, as a believer, there's no more war with him. The true Christian, listen, the true believer knows this already. You're not, you're not, you don't see God grinding an ax anymore. You see him like this with outstretched arms. My problem is this, which is probably your problem. God, I know your arms are outstretched, but I'm so, I'm so efficient at missing you. <laughs> you got to help me, God. Help me with myself. What you don't want to do is say, God, I'm going to help myself and then I'll come to you. God says, Oy vey, this is going to take forever. Come to me like you are and I'll do it. His arms are outstretched to you. He wants you to know forgiveness. And I'm just challenging. I know for some it might be stinging or maybe there's an awakening. But for some of you, you've never heard this before. That a true heaven-bound believer knows they're justified. And that humbles us. We know that we're forgiven. And that humbles us. And we know that we're no longer warring against God. And that humbles us. And it says that that is true. That's obtained through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2. Through whom also we have access by faith into his grace. This is an amazing word, access. It, it means what you think it means, but it means even more than that. Do you guys remember the be most beautiful Old Testament picture of the meaning of this word? Do you remember when Esther needed to appear before the king, her husband, to intercede for the Jews? And Uncle Mordecai had told her, listen, girl, You've been brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. I mean, you may be a cutie. And according to the Bible, she was a knockout. In fact, the Bible says the king, the king actually had, he had a hard time functioning when he saw her. He was overwhelmed by her beauty. If the Bible says that your beauty is overwhelming, it must be something. But even still, she couldn't walk in. She just couldn't walk in and say, hi, king. What's up? <laughs> Did you know according to protocol that those of the elite guard that protected the king, that if he didn't raise his scepter, it didn't matter who it was. If he didn't raise his scepter, they would pull out their swords and off with their head on the floor in the, in the foyer of the king's throne right there. That's why the Bible says she fasted for three days and three nights because she had determined, I've got to go talk to him. And you couldn't talk to the king without an invitation. And Esther walks in there and the Bible tells us that he saw her and apparently he lifted his staff and she approached him and she began to intercede for her people. But that access, he held back the danger and his kingly heart opened wide her entrance. Listen, protocol was broken and she was welcomed in. That's the word. According to the Bible, he has given you and I access into his presence. It's wide open. There's no qualification. All of God's children come boldly, come anytime, come now, come 24-7 always. Listen, you never, again, please take this lovingly. You never have to go and wait in line to have someone pray for you. You never have to get in line and wait for the doors to open to confess your sins. He is 24-7 available to the believer and you go to him directly and you speak to him constantly. Can I assume for all of us who know Jesus that our daily walks with him are constantly an ongoing, non-stop conversation? I realize sometimes I kneel, sometimes I stand, 
I'm not joking when I tell you. Many times, my prayer life is most clear to me when I'm doing things where I'm relaxing. And I told you, you're sick of hearing this. But if I'm gardening or mowing the lawn, my mind is at rest. I'm open, and it's like an antenna. It's like a dish. God, speak to me. Maybe for you, it's surfing or, 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 or something. I don't know, but have you found it? Do you know what it is? The believer knows this. Yes, I just heard that. Walking, that's another great one. Walking, just walk. I love that. The Bible says often, Abraham walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Amen. Moses walked with God. Find it. Now, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here right now. This is a tough message to deliver because... There are some of you here that are going to heaven. There are some of you here that are, you're thinking that you're going to go to heaven. There's some of you that are here and you're wondering, what is this all about? I'll tell you what it's about simply. God is not a pipe dream. He's not a story. He's the actual creator of the universe. And he died on the cross because he loves you. He paid your sin debt at the cross and mine rose again from the dead so that you could be with him in heaven. God died to get you to his presence access. He wanted you to have such an access that he died. The eternal God died to have you come into his presence. Parents are amazing. God bless parents. It's not easy being a parent. Parents are like this. Stand up, sit down, get your finger out of your nose. Stop, zip, put your zipper up. Stop pulling her hair. Put... I just had a thought. Somebody, I... you're not going... You're not going out there until you put your underwear on. <laughs> our daughter, she's going to kill me for this, but our, our youngest daughter, when she would get angry, when she was little, we have pictures of this. We're fighting over the garden hose in the, in the backyard. She's two years old, and, and we're going like this. And I'm trying to get something done, and she's trying to get the garden hose. And when she got angry, she pulled her pants down. <laughs> and... One summer we were at the beach and she's probably two or three and she was angry and she went and stood on some guy's surfboard next to us and pulled her pants down. And uh, one of our friends said, dude, you better hope she gets over that by the time she's 17. <laughs> now you don't tell her I said that. But... Um, I so departed from my point in that illustration. <laughs> it's access. My kids, like your kids, parenting, you have all the rules. But we tried to make sure that our kids had access. People in the house, in and out of the house, church life happening, this church, home Bible study growing. One of the big convictions of your heart as a parent is making sure that your kids can just come into your room at any moment. And um, why? Because God's like that with us. We don't take advantage of that enough. Do you have a problem going on in your life? Something rough happening? When's the last time you walked into his presence? You say, God, I got a problem. You know, he's listening. I'd like to look at it this way. The reason why grandparents are called grandparents is because parents are all about the law, like keep your pants on, <laughs> get your finger out of your nose. They're like the law. Grandparents, we're like, we're like grace. <laughs> when the grandkids are picking their nose, what are you finding up there? <laughs> don't, don't hurt yourself. right? That's why we're grandparents. The parents lay down the rules and the grandparents are all about grace. You come over here. You've that, that's why, by the way, that's kids. The reason why grandparents have a special place with their kids is because we share a mutual enemy. We raised our kids, and then we prayed while we were raising them. I hope this happens to them someday. <laughs> Didn't we? Raise your hand if that's... Yes! Remember how they treated us? And then we said, mm, mm. I pray that on them when the day comes. 
But uh, <laughs> grandparents are tied to their grandchildren because affectionately they, we, have a, we share a mutual enemy. Of course, I'm being, I'm being funny. But the thing is this, that there's a sense where it doesn't matter what I'm doing. Stop the presses, stop the train, stop the plane. My grandkids here. If that can happen in life, God wants it to happen with you. We make it so confusing. We muddy it all up. We experience a favored position with him because we have this peace that's with God. No more fighting. The shalom of God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 tells us, be anxious for nothing. Boy, that's a verse for today. Stop worrying. And everything by prayer. Listen, here's how you stop worrying. By the way, worry is a sin. Number one, pray. Make supplication. That means pray for yourself. Pray for others. And do it with thanksgiving. Start thanking God in the darkness of your hour. Let your request be made known to God. I love that. Look at that statement. Let your request be made known to God. Do you know what that means today in modern English? Don't post it on Instagram. <laughs> Don't tweet it somewhere. Don't put it on Facebook. Take it to God first. You know how easy it is to pick up your device and say something? I think God is saying to us, put down your device and say something. Talk to me. He wants us to talk to him. Let your request be made known to God. Verse 7. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will garrison, guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Wow. What a powerful statement that is. That it will protect us, church. It will protect you and I. There's so many angry and bitter people today because they've never stopped long enough to realize that they can't forgive anybody because they themselves know that they're not forgiven. And only in Jesus can that be changed. And it must change for you, please. Isaiah 48, verse 22, the Bible says, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. The Bible says in another place that their lives and minds and souls are like the troubled sea. The wicked are those who hate God. The wicked are those who will not know him. They refuse to know him. And God says, and is it not true? Look at the people who you and I know who they refuse to know God. And in their insides, oh, they got, the outside looks polished and clean. The inside, their souls are troubled like the troubled sea. They got to take drugs to go to sleep. They got to take drugs to wake up. They can't allow anybody near or close into their lives for fear that they may be found out. They live in a sheltered world, a fake world. I was talking to a police officer yesterday about the falsehood of the Hollywood scene and the lifestyle of the rich and famous and police officers are often called in to those homes and you see the brokenness. He was telling me it's just unbelievably horrific. Well, if I just had more money, if you had more money, you'd get in bigger trouble. The heart's got to change. God's all about that. J.C. Ryle writes this, to be prayerless is to be without God, without Christ, without grace, without hope, without heaven. You see, one of the hallmarks of the real believer is that we talk with God. Jesus said it this way in John 14, 27, peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. Isn't that awesome? God gives a peace, and I want you to ask yourself, do you have that peace and then finally, church, it's this. Forgiveness brings us back to life, if you think about it. We have this access by faith into this grace. Verse 2 goes on to say, in which we watch. Number one, stand. Number two, rejoice. Number three, hope. And number four, glory. Brings us back to life. Um, I was reading a 
article this weekend by Charles Spurgeon, and Spurgeon had made mention that when he was saved at the age of 16, he had a kind of a rough life, Charles Spurgeon. And he said all of a sudden when he accepted Christ, the sky turned more blue, and the English green hills turned more green, and the clouds were more bright. Now you know those things didn't change one bit, huh? But what changed? His, his insides, his view, his look. Something happened to him. And in conclusion, listen, the believer has experienced this forgiveness that brings us back to life. I'm going to ask you to consider uh, maybe a big lift. And that is to go from this place today and just pick one person that you may not have the best relationship with. Is it somebody at work? Is it, is it a family member? Is it a neighbor? Just pick one. Start with one. Ask God to give you the strength and the power by his spirit for you to treat them like a brother or a sister. You say, Jack, I work for Satan. How, could, how can this be possible? <laughs> Just try it. Why? Because if we decide today to stand in the forgiveness that God has provided us, and in the status that he's provided us, that you and I have access to God, doesn't it bear out that if I, Jack, have access to God, that I should be living differently? Do you not agree with that? That if I come out of the presence of God, should that not be experienced by you? In other words, shouldn't you be able to tell? And in so doing, if I begin to target with affection, right, one person, because I've been forgiven, God forgave me, that I do the same to somebody else. Amen. I'm telling you right now, if you're hearing me, if you're hearing me, this will change your marriage right now. If a husband or a wife would right now humble themselves and say, you know what, I'm going to do that to you. You make me sick most of the time. You drive me nuts. <laughs> but I'm going to do that. I heard what he said. Makes sense. It's a God thing. I don't have the power to do it. But I'm going to seek God's power to do it. I'm going to do my best today. I'm going to, one day at a time, I'm going to treat you like Jesus treats me. And I'm, gonna do, I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it for him. You have to make that clear. Well, you know, I say that not to be mean. I say that because if they see you doing it for him, then they can do the same because they might be just as angry back at you. And you're not a big enough motivation for them to do it. The benefits are not all that great. But if God is the target for why you do what you do, then it changes things. It'll be a great, great shift. You stand. And then what happens? You rejoice. This word rejoice is remarkable. You stand. That is, you're standing firm. You're equipped to stand. Your, your feet are set like concrete. And then the word rejoice, this is an interesting word. Hang on, listen to it all the way out. The word means to take pride. It means to boast. But this is a sanctified pride, if you can put it that way, or a sanctified boasting. It means that you are proud or boasting in your association with God. It's to exalt God in your life, to rejoice. It implies that you're exalting Jesus in your stance. And the result is hope. The word hope here is awesome. It means that is an expectant hope. It's not a hope, hope, oh, I hope. I hope that happens. Oh no, that's not the word. It means it hasn't arrived yet, but you can, uh, actually, you, can get suit, you can get dressed up and get ready to go. That's how sure you are. You go down to the airport like that, right? You just 
Get your ticket, stand there, wait. There's no plane at the gate. What are you, what are you doing there? I'm going to go on a trip. <laughs> yeah? I don't see any plane. It's coming. In a moment, a plane is going to pull up to that gate. And God's word to you is, I'm coming. I'm bringing it. I'll give you all that you need. Just get ready to receive it. Here it comes. And you hope in that. And then glory. Doxa. It's where we get the word doxology. Glory. It means to give praise, honor, glory, to approve of, to brighten. It's a beautiful, watch this. It means to brighten or to brighten up, to illuminate or to light up. The doxology of God. In Luke 6, 37, I like it this way. We're almost done. Luke 6, 37, Jesus said, judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I have to tell you, are you listening, church? We're almost done. Please don't miss this. That's impossible to do. You have to have a, you have to have a new heart for that to happen. You have to, have, kind of have, you have to have the kind of heart that says, that God speaks to and says, you can't do that, Jack, can you? No, sir, I can't. So ask me to do it through you. Yes, Lord, please do that through me. Luke 17, verse 3 says, Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. You know what that means? It means you tell him his fault privately. You don't, you don't go like this. Oh, man, my brother really ticked me off. You know what he did? He did this, this, and this, and this, and this. And so I'm going to go give him a piece of my mind. So don't tell anybody I told you that, but I'm going to go tell them. Did you know that you just, according to the scriptures, you just sinned a major sin? God says, I hate gossips. If somebody offended you, the Bible commands you to go to them alone. And you say, this is how you hurt me, or this is what you said, and this is what was wrong. And the Bible says there, if he repents, forgive him. That's key, by the way. If he repents, forgive him. If he says, drop dead, I don't want to hear from you again. You don't issue forgiveness in the way of communication. You issue forgiveness in your heart. Because God has forgiven you. You don't let that person own you. If someone's hurt you and they won't meet and talk, you say, Lord, give me the strength now by your spirit to forgive them, because I know that's your will. And God will honor that, and he, that person will no longer have power over you. That's why God gives us the ability to forgive, so that you can be freed from that person who will not forgive you. But if that person does say, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and let's talk about it, let's work it out, then there's fellowship restored. Verse 4 says, Luke 17, 4 says, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, Jesus said, you shall forgive him. That's a toughie, is it not? Do you remember when Peter said, Lord, if... Uh, if somebody comes and sins against me, do I forgive him seven times? Do you remember what Jesus told him? <laughs> Jesus said, no. I bet you Peter goes, oh, whew. Because he's probably thinking, watch this, guys. I'm going to go ask Jesus this question. This is how awesome I am. <laughs> hey, Jesus, if somebody sins against me seven times and I forgive him seven times, it's pretty good, right? Jesus goes, nope. Seventy times seven. In other words, Without number. You say, Jack, I don't like this. We're really ending on a downer here. <laughs> I know it is true. It's too bad everybody can't be like us. <laughs> you know that one time we sinned and we asked God to forgive us? We never went back a second time. We didn't have to. Oh, did we? Oh, seven times. Whew. Boy, I would never sin seven times in a day. You say, Pastor, what is it you're confessing? I'm not confessing anything. 
I'm just telling you, you, may, you can sit in a house bubble wrapped. You'll still sin. You know why? Because you can't bubble wrap your brain. Your mind is out there running all around town while you're sitting in the couch on a bubble. You can be a monk, go to the monastery, and you're still monkeying around in your mind. How many times do you and I go to God and say, God, please forgive me for my temper on the highway or for my attitude or for not, listen to this, or for not doing that thing today that I should have done? I should have gone to visit them. They're sick. I should have gone to them. They're hurting. You see now? He's so good. Last verse. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What a beautiful God we have. Church, let's stand together. And that word uh, doxology is that glory word. Do you guys remember this? I don't know how many of you ever attended Calvary Costa Mesa. I don't know. It's the only church I ever knew. Maybe all churches do this, but Pastor Chuck would always say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Remember that? Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's known as the doxology. Did you know that? It's to illuminate the room. It's to illuminate the heart. Every single one of us live and breathe off of issuing forgiveness and being forgiven. So you guys go out into this world after this service and put a dent in Satan's car door. Because he's all about bitter, he's all about angry, he's all about ugly. And when you go forgive people, it glorifies Christ, and I'm certain it puts a dent in the devil's door. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are the God that forgives. No one can find a better message in any book ever written to man than what you gave us. The Bible, the book of forgiveness, it's not found in the Quran, it's not found in Hinduism, it's not found in Shintoism, but it's found among all those who choose to follow you because you are the forgiving God. And so, Lord, we give our lives to you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your love.